This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show in Brazil, where a far-right former army officer is moving closer to becoming the next president of the world's fourth-largest democracy. On Sunday, Jair Bolsonaro won 46 percent of the vote in a far more decisive victory than was expected. Because he didn't hit 50 percent, he'll now face Fernando Haddad of the Leftist Workers' Party in a runoff on October 28. Adagi won 29 percent of the vote Sunday. Many critics of Bolsonaro warn the future of democracy in Brazil is now at risk. Bolsonaro has openly praised Brazil's military dictatorship, which lasted from 1964 to 85. He also has a long history of making racist, homophobic and misogynistic comments, once telling a female lawmaker she was too ugly to rape. He's encouraged police to kill suspected drug dealers. In April, he was actually charged with hate speech over <clears throat> over his tirades. But Bolsonaro's popularity has soared in recent weeks, after he was stabbed while out on the campaign trail. On Sunday, he briefly spoke after casting his vote. All of this has brought and awoken the people to the idea that Brazil can't continue on the path to socialism. We don't want to be tomorrow what Venezuela is today. On Sunday, Jair Bolsonaro's Social Liberal Party won unexpected victories across Brazil. In Brazil's lower house, Bolsonaro's party won 52 seats, up from just eight. It's now the second largest party in the chamber. Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo, received more votes than any congressional candidate in Brazil's history. Meanwhile, Brazilian voters ousted a stunning two-thirds of incumbents Sunday. Jair Bolsonaro also directly benefited from the jailing of former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who had been leading all presidential polls earlier this year. Lula has been in jail since April in what many consider trumped-up corruption charges. His handpicked successor, former Sao Paulo mayor Fernando Haddad, now faces an uphill fight against Bolsonaro in the October 28th runoff. On Monday, Haddad traveled to meet with Lula in his cell and discuss strategy. Afterwards, he said he was ready for the next round of voting. We're very excited for the second round, because the second round offers an opportunity that we didn't have in the first round, to debate the projects that each one of the remaining candidates advocate for the country. We'll have an important opportunity to compare these two projects so that voters have an opportunity, in my opinion, that they didn't have in the first round of comparison. Meanwhile, the Workers' Party suffered major defeats in legislative races. Former Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff lost her bid for a Brazilian Senate seat, winning just 15 percent of the vote. We're joined right now by Maria Luisa Mendonça. She's director of the Network for Social Justice and Human Rights in Brazil, joining us in our New York studio. Welcome to Democracy Now! Can you talk about what took place on Sunday and the significance of Bolsonaro's not outright victory? He still has the runoff, but uh, he got many more votes than was expected. Yes, that's a very dangerous situation in Brazil that I think is very important to monitor, because that could have an impact in the whole region. Um, like you said before, uh, former President Lula, actually, uh, if uh, he was able to run, he would probably win very easily. But there was a vacuum created, because uh, he was put in jail uh, with charges of receiving a bribe, but actually there is no uh, evidence that he received the bribe. So, since the, pre the parliamentary coup against President Dilma Rousseff two years ago, we are in the situation of a limbo. We cannot consider that we have a democracy in Brazil right now. And uh, so, Bolsonaro is the result of a series of uh, attacks on democracy that started two years ago with the parliamentary coup against Dilma Rousseff. So, Dilma Rousseff um, is couped out. Uh, she is forced out of the presidency. And then um, Lula, who is the who decided to run for president, is imprisoned. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we said that there was a coup because uh, there was no evidence that she committed any crimes, and but she was impeached anyway. And Bolsonaro at that time voted, uh, as a Congress member, voted for the impeachment in the name of the person who tortured her during the military dictatorship when she was in prison. What do you mean he ordered the impeach—he supported the impeachment in his honor? 
Yes, because during the vote uh, in Congress, most Congress members voted in the name of the God, in the name of their family, and Bolsonaro voted in the name of the person who tortured Dilma during the you military know, dictatorship. I want to go to Dilma Rousseff. I interviewed her in April here. She was ousted in 2016 in what she's described as a coup, and I asked her about the rise of the far right. Yes, I can indeed. The far right in Brazil, like the far right everywhere, is anti-woman, anti-black, anti-indigenous persons, and it is in favor of ending all oversight. And they struggled for this. They want to end any oversight of labor work situations analogous to slavery that continue to exist in Brazil. They are full of prejudice and intolerance, and they believe that they can resolve the most complex problems using brute force of violence, open violence. What happened in the vote in the impeachment process that I suffered, where legislator Bolsonaro cast his vote paying tribute to the military dictatorship and torture, and the torturer, whose name was Carlos Alberto Prijante Ultra, in casting his vote, he paid tribute to this man who was a torturer in Sao Paulo, and he was recognized in all of the processes of truth and justice that unfolded in Brazil. He said the following to pay tribute to someone who brought terror to President Dilma Rousseff, a person who is capable during an impeachment proceeding to justify his vote in this manner is a person who sows hatred. He spreads hatred because he only understands one language, the language of violence. And that's Dilma Rousseff, the former Brazilian president who was impeached. I was speaking to her when she was at the University of California, Berkeley. Maria Luisa Mendonça, she describes Bolsonaro. If you can talk more about Bolsonaro's history and what exactly he represents. Yeah, he represents uh, the, uh, sec the uh, sec sector of the military that uh, is openly fascist. Like you said before, he talks about raping women openly. He said that he'd rather have a dead son than a gay son. He praises the military dictatorship. He, he said that he would give uh, 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 the police—the uh, uh, police should be free to kill. So it's a very— Let me go to him in his own words. Okay. Uh, 2013 interview with then, while well, he was congressman, Jair Bolsonaro on BBC. I went into battle with the gays because the government proposed anti-homophobia classes for the junior grades. Do primeiro grau, né? But that would actively stimulate homosexuality in children from six years old. This is not normal. Your culture is different to ours. We're not ready for all of this in Brazil, because no father would ever take pride in having a gay son. Pride, happiness, celebrate if his son turns out gay? No way. That's Jair Bolsonaro, the front runner in Brazil, also, as you said, said um, told a congresswoman she was too ugly to rape. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, we. What happens now also is there is a lot of uh, media manipulation. Uh, since the impeachment of President Dilma two years ago, there is constant attacks on the PT, on the Workers' Party. Uh, it was almost like all mainstream media in Brazil is like Fox News. There is no alternative. And uh, also now, during the campaign, uh, Bolsonaro started a com uh, campaign of fake news, uh, especially on WhatsApp, that is not controlled. For example, Facebook has uh, closed several accounts that uh, were spreading fake news against Fernando Haddad and against uh, the candidate for vice president, Manuela. Uh, so, you know, uh, also Steve Bannon is one of the advisors for Bolsonaro. So there is a lot of misinformation and manipulation. In August, Jair Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo, posted a photo on Twitter of him with former Trump strategist Steve Bannon. Eduardo Bolsonaro wrote, quote, It was a pleasure to meet Steve Bannon's strategist in Donald Trump's presidential campaign. We had a great conversation, and we shared the same worldview, and we're certainly in touch to join forces, especially against cultural Marxism. And the significance of what Eduardo himself, Jair's son. Yes, exactly. And, uh, 
Well, on, I think that it's also important to understand that uh, the media in Brazil is portraying Fernando Haddad, the progressive candidate, as far left. But when he was the mayor of Sao Paulo, actually, what he did was uh, he built uh, several daycares and more than 30 hospitals, and uh, he tried to make the traffic in the city better, for example, having infrastructure for bikes. When he was uh, Ministry of uh, Education under the Lula administration, he created more than 18 new federal universities, more than 300 new um, campuses, university campuses, and uh, there was much more um, incentive and uh, uh, fellowships for uh, education at all levels. So, you know, he comes from an educational background, and uh, it's, uh, you know, he doesn't come from any type of uh, extreme <laughs> left background. And so what, what we have now is a very extreme fascist candidate running against a moderate candidate that—and uh, our hope now is that uh, three other candidates, progressive candidates, have uh, said that they would support Fernando Haddad now in the runoff elections in a few weeks. So hopefully, you know, between now and then, uh, they you will be able to— You think that could make up the difference and then the runoff? I think so, because those progressive candidates together will probably get about 20 percent of the votes, and uh, if they are able to, you know, convince people that uh, this is a dangerous path. And uh, the challenge is uh, how do we deal with media manipulation, mm. you know, not just mainstream media, but the, the manipulation on social media. I wanted to go to Noam Chomsky, who just recently went to Brazil. Um, he met with Lula in prison, um, and when he came out, uh, Chomsky condemned Brazil's right-wing media. We have just had the great privilege of uh, spending an hour with Lula. And one of the points that he emphasized was that uh, during his entire tenure in office, there was just a constant flood of attacks from all the media, constant you know, thousands of attacks from every direction, which, of course, confuses and undermines public opinion. So the answer to your question is something is needed to counter the concentrated power of right-wing media, which, particularly in Latin America, just overwhelms everything. So that's the world-renowned linguist and political activist Noam Chomsky. As we wrap up um, and leading into this runoff, the significance of the media in shaping pop popular opinion in Brazil. Yeah, that's very important, because uh, during the administration of Dilma Rousseff, just an example, an employment rate was 4 percent, and now it's 15 percent. So, of course, you know, that is an economic crisis, and uh, but instead of uh, looking at the future, that is, uh, the, the mainstream media uh, plays this role of uh, giving incentive to fear, and that creates the space for a fascist candidate like Bolsonaro. So the question is how the—because the, the left-wing parties already announced they're going to unite, be united for the second round. The question is how the neoliberal parties, the, let's say, the mainstream conservative parties that, uh, you know, are implementing structural adjustment policies, how, let's say, the mainstream conservative neoliberal parties would then uh, what, what decision they're going to make, because it's a risky decision to support a far-right fascist candidate. So I think that's the main question. Mm. Well, Maria Luisa Mendonça, I want to thank you so much for being with us, director of the Network for Social Justice and Human Rights in Brazil. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go to Manchester, England, to speak with Dr. Kevin Anderson about a new U.N. climate report as a monster hurricane bears down on the panhandle in Florida, and the Alabama governor declares the whole state an emergency. Stay with us.